Great. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'll just wait a few minutes just to let everyone kind of get settled and uh, apologize. We're a few minutes late getting started and then we'll get going. Alrighty, so we'll get started now. Um, again, apologize, we are a few minutes late getting going. Um, but I'd like to say uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Manitoba HIV program webinar, uh, introducing Manitoba's new HIV testing and prevention guidelines for primary care providers. Uh, we are so excited to have about 200 providers tuning in from all over the province uh, for today's presentation. Uh, my name is Dr. Kelby Trelor, and I will be your moderator today. I'm a family physician working out in Brandon. Um, in addition to having my own practice at the Brandon Clinic, I also work at the Brandon HIV as well as trans health clinics. Today we are welcoming Drs. Ireland and Sharkey to speak with you about uh, some of the latest data in HIV in Manitoba, as well as the new provincial guidelines on HIV testing and prevention. Uh, today's webinar has been certified by the College of Family Physicians of Canada and the Manitoba chapter for up to one main pro plus certified credits. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Manitoba HIV program website uh, after we are done. Just advance the slide. Uh, before we begin, we want to acknowledge that the Manitoba HIV program operates on the original lands of the Ashinaabe, Cree, Oja Cree, Assiniboine, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and is the homeland of the Métis Nation. Uh, for those of you that have questions, please type them into the Q&A box, not the chat box, and we do have an upvote um, if you have the same question as someone else. Uh, this webinar has received financial support from Vive Healthcare Canada, Gilead Sciences Canada, and Merrick in the form of an educational grant slash sponsorship. Uh, potential conflicts of interest include Gilead Sciences Canada, as uh, they benefit from the sale of a medication that will be discussed in this program, uh, the generic name being tenofovir m which is the brand name Truvada. Uh, so our agenda for today, we will be reviewing some HIV surveillance data. We will go through the Manitoba HIV program, HIV testing guidelines, uh, Manitoba HIV program prevention guidelines, um, and then leave uh, time at the end as well for questions. And as I mentioned, please do put the questions in the Q&A box, not in the chat box. And we do have that upvote um, if you have the same question as someone else. Excellent. So I am happy to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Lori Ireland. Uh, Dr. Ireland completed her medical school at the University of Manitoba in 2005 and her family practice training in 2007 in the St. Paul's Hospital program at the University of British Columbia. Her residency training was followed by a three-month enhanced skills program in HIV primary care under the supervision of the BC Center of Excellence in HIV and AIDS. Lori currently works at 
with Nine Circles Community Health Center, where she is a medical director and the primary care lead with the Manitoba HIV program. Welcome, Lori. I'm just going to pull up my slide. Okay, thank, thanks again, Kelby. I'd also like to thank our um, Kimberly Templeton, who's our HIV program lead, as well as our scientific committee, Shri Chance Owen, Lori Ringert, and Bria, Bria for all the work they've done to put together this webinar. I have no uh, relationship with financial sponsors to disclose. I'm gonna start with some data on HIV surveillance from Manitoba Health and Seniors Care, who just released their 2020 HIV surveillance report on December 1st, World AIDS Day, just last week, along with some information on HIV testing rate, rates from uh, CADM Provincial Lab. And I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank everyone who collaborated in putting together this data and analysis. Uh, first, some information on uh, HIV in Canada from surveillance from uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, there was a significant decrease in the number of HIV, HIV cases identified in 2020, likely due to a decrease in access to um, testing services since the start of the pandemic. The national incident rate dropped to 4.3 per 100,000. However, um, Manitoba does continue to have the second highest rate of HIV across the country, uh, noted as seven per 100,000 in the national surveillance data. Nationally, women made up just under 30% of new cases in 2020, and a third of women identified injection drug use as their main risk for transmission. In men, nationally, about 13% identified injection drug use as their main risk for transmission. In Manitoba, in 2020, there were 117 new cases of HIV for an incidence rate um, of 8.4 per 100,000. This discrepancy with the national data is due to, in Manitoba, we look at both new diagnoses in the provinces and those that were introduced. For example, people who were tested outside of the province and then already were known to be HIV positive and moved to, into the province in 2020. Manitoba Health also notes in their report that any decrease in HIV cases reported in 2020 was likely due due to decreased access to testing and therefore decreased case identification rather than a true decrease in incident cases last year. When we look just at new HIV cases diagnosed in Manitoba, the blue bars on this graph and exclude cases introduced into Manitoba, we see that here that the rates of new infections diagnosed in the province continue to increase over the last four years from 63 new cases in 2017 to 97 last year. The Manitoba HIV pr program is introducing routine HIV testing guidelines in an effort to normalize routine HIV testing, increase testing rates across the province in order to help diagnose and link people living with HIV to care and treatment earlier in their disease course to improve outcomes and decrease transmission rates. While the testing rates um, you can see on this slide um, vary by age and sex. D data from the CADM lab shows that only approximately a quarter of adults have been tested for HIV at least once in the last five years, with the highest rates in younger pop populations and in women. Testing rates also vary by region, with the highest HIV testing rate per capita in the Northern Health region at about 14%, followed by the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority with lower testing rates in the south, lowest testing rates in the south. The red bars on this graph show rates in 2019 in each region and in the brown bar for 2020, 2020 testing rates declined in every region, um, except the south, which stayed rather stable at less than 5%. Um, likely also due to decreased access uh, to testing during the pandemic is why we saw uh, lower testing rates. Um, so this equals about 11,000 fewer people that were screened for HIV in 2020 compared to the year prior. Um, HIV testing positivity rates also vary 
per region and are um, in the range of 0.1 to 0.4%. On this slide, the red bars show our, the total tests done in 2019 per region with the red triangle then corresponding to positivity rates. The brown bars are total tests in 2020 with the circles then corresponding to positivity rates. While we did experience decreased testing rates in 2020, positivity rates increased in every region in, in the province with the highest positivity rates in Winnipeg at 0.44%, followed by the Prairie Mount, Mountain Health region at 0.28%. For those who did test positive for HIV in 2020, for both men and women, the most common identified risk for transmission was injection drug use. For men, when there was um, risk information um, available, 23% reported injection drug use as their main risk for transmission. This was more commonly reported than men who have sex with men. For women, 36.7% identified injection drug use as their main risk for transmission. I, with the Manitoba Health 2020 surveillance data, less than 50% of cases had ethnicity data. So that data was not released in the, in the 2020 report. Manitoba Health does note in their report that individuals may be less likely to report their ethnicity due to fear of racism, stigma, or discrimination. Given the incomplete data, it does not reflect necessarily a complete picture of who was infected. They chose not to disclose that ethnicity data. The Manitoba HIV program does have the opportunity to do more in-depth analysis and an annual program audit for new cases to care in order to identify trends and guide program planning to address the inequities we see with key populations at risk. In 2018, we saw that greater than 50% of new cases to care self-identified as Indigenous. The Manitoba HIV program is currently undertaking an in-depth program audit of our 2019 and 2020 data collaborated with CIHR research chair, Dr. Zuma Rueda and Dr. Yoav Keenan to better understand some of the concerning trends that we are seeing in new cases to care. Some of this data was actually presented at Bug Day and highlighted some concerning trends which include increasing rates of injection drug use, primarily crystal meth, high rates of uh, co-infections with other sexually transmitted infections at the time of HIV diagnosis, and increasingly, we are seeing new cases of HIV affecting young Indigenous women. We do recognize the inequities that put people at risk for HIV are a direct result of colonial practices and systemic racism. We encourage providers to offer routine testing to normalize testing. Um, we, and the program is dedicated to finding ways to decrease barriers to testing um, and to decrease stigma to identify those living with HIV and support linkage to care for treatment and to offer supportive services to help address some of the social determinants of health that put individuals at risk. So the HIV program is introducing their uh, new testing guidelines in an effort again to normalize and increase HIV testing throughout the province. These are the new testing recommendations. We recommend providers offer routine testing for HIV to know the status of all patients in their care. Primary care screening and prevention recommendations differ based on whether a patient is living with HIV or not. For example, recommendations for immunization, cervical cancer screening are different for those living with HIV such that to be able to provide quality care that meets standards, providers should know the HIV status of patients in their care. Routine testing does not require a, re a review of risk factors for transmission, but should be offered to all 12 to 70 years of age, at least once every five years. If risk factors for HIV acquisition are identified, testing should be offered at minimum annually. Risk factors for acquisition include men who have sex with men, inclusive of both cis and transgender men, people who inject drugs, and people who have unprotected sex with multiple partners. Additionally, we also recommend offering an HIV test to key populations annually if their HIV status is unknown or if risks have been identified. HIV has historically and continues to disproportionately affect vulnerable populations, those affected by discrimination, poverty, homelessness, overcrowding, putting them at risk for infection. Key populations may change over time, but currently in Manitoba, 
It includes people from countries where HIV is endemic and indigenous populations. Endemic countries include Sub-Saharan Africa, the Caribbean, Central and South Central America and Asia. In 2018, 22% of new clients to care in Manitoba uh, self-identified as from endemic countries. And as stated earlier, over 50% of new clients to care identified as Indigenous. We recognize that the higher burden of HIV in Indigenous peoples is related to historic and ongoing colonial impacts and structural racism. Providers should increase their understanding of the historic and current context of HIV in Indigenous peoples to increase their knowledge and offer culturally safe care in order to inquire about risk factors and offer testing. Um, a good resource is the Manitoba Indigenous Cultural Safety Training, which is an online eight week course that is designed for service provider, providers uh, who work directly or indirectly directly with Indigenous people in Manitoba and aims to improve our ability to develop and deliver culturally safe care. Other indications for HIV testing um, are when someone is new to your care and their HIV status is unknown, if you're testing for other sexually transmitted infections, testing for tuberculosis, if someone presents with symptoms of acute HIV, such as flu-like symptoms, uh, rash, fever, sore throat, if someone prevents, presents sorry, with a new or worsening condition associated with HIV, such as recurrent pneumonias or thrush, if risk factors are identified following sexual assault and in pregnancy, we recommend testing in, first, in the first and third trimester, as well at, at delivery if someone's HIV status is unknown. Additionally, HIV testing should be offered if a patient requests it. There is no requirement for uh, informed consent other than what is it's the same as for any other diagnostic test. Uh, people just need to be uh, um, reminded of window periods and uh, followed up for results. The test that's done at Cadham Provincial Lab is a fourth generation test, um, combined antigen antibody test. Uh, people, you can see on the graph there that it's looking for a P24 antigen as well as antibodies. Uh, the P24 antigen will be present as early as um, potentially two weeks after someone has been infected. Antibodies are present, um, can start to develop. You can see on the graph just after three weeks and in 95% of people are present um, at a month. It is possible still that the window period can be up to 12 weeks in a small percentage of people. For results will be reported as negative, positive, or indeterminate. Indeterminate results may mean early infection in the lab result right on the CADM provincial lab result that you get back as a provider. It will give you information on recommendations or repeat for repeat testing. Um, if someone uh, receives a positive result, they sh this should be relayed to individuals as soon as possible. Provide patients with reassurance that treatment is available and is often um, with as little as one pill once per day for HIV treatment. People living with HIV have a normal or near normal life expectancy depending on other comorbidities or how long they've been living with HIV. People should also be provided information on preventing transmission. When providing negative results, this also provides an opportunity to discuss preventative strategies. And Dr. Sharkey is gonna be telling us a little bit more about that today. Uh, so just in summary, the key messages we want to relay with uh, testing recommendations is to please offer routine HIV testing in your practice. When testing for one infection, test for all. Up to 25% of people living with HIV are unaware of their diagnosis. And unfortunately, 25 to 50% of people living with HIV are diagnosed already late in their disease course. Earlier diagnosis and, tre and treatment improves outcomes for individuals. U equals U means undetectable equals untransmittable for people who are adherent to treatment. Their um, HIV viral loads go down to low levels or suppressed or undetectable levels that make sexual transmission negligible or the risk of sexual transmission negligible. Uh, and please counsel patients on preventative strategies. Again, um, uh, Bria is going to tell us more about that today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Ireland. 
Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Bria Sharkey. Dr. Sharkey is a family physician with an interest in HIV and addictions medicine. She obtained her medical degree at the University of Manitoba. Her family medicine residency was completed at the University of British Columbia, where she also completed an extra year of training in HIV, addictions, and inner city health. She is currently working at Nine Circles Community Health Center. Thank you, Dr. Shirk. Thanks very much, Kelby. Um, Kelby, can you hear me okay? Perfect. All right. So um, I don't have any relationships with the financial sponsors of the event to disclose. Um, and to mitigate bias, I'll use generic rather than trade names um, in the discussion about meds for pre-exposure prophylaxis that will be evidence-based. Okay, so today I'll be talking about the Manitoba HIV program, HIV prevention guidelines. And we're gonna review seven methods of HIV prevention with a particular focus on pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is also referred to as PrEP. So at the end of this presentation, I hope that you'll have an understanding of a comprehensive strategy for HIV prevention. Uh, and in particular, my goal is the primary care providers here who aren't currently prescribing PrEP are gonna realize that you know, PrEP prescribing is fairly straightforward to integrate into primary care. Um, and I'll run through how to register to become a PrEP prescriber and highlight some resources that you can reference if a patient asks you about PrEP. So for the purposes of this discussion, uh, I'm gonna be focusing mostly on summarizing clinically relevant information rather than going into the evidence behind the recommendations, partly because of time restrictions, um, but mostly because the end goal here is just to walk away with a practical approach to HIV prevention, but there will be time for questions at the end. Okay, so the first component of HIV prevention that we'll talk about is uh, routine testing for HIV and other sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections, which I'm gonna to refer to as STBBIs. Okay, so Lori already did an excellent job of reviewing the HIV testing recommendations. So early detection and treatment of HIV helps to prevent onward transmission. The Canadian guidelines on sexually transmitted infections from the Public Health Agency of Canada um, have extensive uh, testing and treatment recommendations for STBBIs. Um, so I encourage you to reference that document for guidance on the specifics of STBBI testing. Um, but in general, this includes uh, routine screening of patients at a frequency that's guided by their individual level of risk, as well as testing that's prompted when symptoms arise. Um, so I won't go into every STI in detail because that's outside of the scope of this presentation and most primary care providers are doing this work on a regular basis. Um, but in general, uh, STBBI screening for asymptomatic patients includes screening for gonorrhea and chlamydia, syphilis, HIV, and hepatitis. And just a reminder to make sure to immunize for hep uh, a and B and HPV when it's indicated. Okay, so this slide is just to highlight the need for throat and rectal swabs to screen for gonorrhea and chlamydia if it's indicated. So rectal swabs are indicated for patients who have receptive anal intercourse and uh, pharyngeal swabs are indicated for those who give oral sex to anyone with a penis. Uh, and the recommended swab for throat and rectal swabs is the aptima swab. So you can see that on the top right of the screen there. And then I just also want to very briefly highlight um, that if a patient has a lesion that you think might be consistent with syphilis or herpes, it's important to swab that lesion in addition to doing the serology for syphilis. So for syphilis, the window period for the serology is longer than the swab. Um, and so you may get a false negative serology early in the course of the infection. Um, the uh, swabs that are up there are accurate. The tubes have changed a little bit. I think they were red top tubes for a while and now I think they're these blue top tubes here. Okay, so patients can be taught to do their own throat and rectal swabs. And these are just the handouts that we put up in the washroom at Nine Circles to help instruct patients to conduct their own swabs. Okay, so the second component of HIV prevention is consistent and correct use of internal and external condoms. So if you're not sure how to direct a patient to use an internal condom, you can just Google CDC, how to use an internal condom. There's nice diagrams and a clear explanation. Um, another component of HIV prevention is harm reduction for people who inject drugs. So that includes uh, using new needles, syringes, and drug use equipment, and uh, opiate agonist therapy for those who have opiate use disorder. Um, you can refer patients to the Street Connections website uh, for information on access to supplies, condoms, and testing across Manitoba. Okay, so the fourth component of HIV prevention that we'll discuss 
is uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis, also known as PrEP. So PrEP is the use of antiretroviral medications for the prevention of HIV in people who are HIV negative, but at high risk of acquiring HIV. So we are gonna be talking about the combination tablet, uh, emtricitabine and tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate, which I'm gonna call tenofovir DIA from now on, so it's slightly less of a tongue twister. Um, and uh, it's now on the Pharmacare formulary as a part two benefit for PrEP. So I'm gonna be speaking specifically about pre-exposure prophylaxis with tenofovir DF and emtricitabine in these next slides. So let's review the eligibility criteria for PrEP. There's three groups that we'll discuss, men who have sex with men, patients engaging in heterosexual sex, and people who inject drugs. So first off, let's look at men who have sex with men, transgender women, and gender diverse people. So eligibility extends to those who have had condomless anal sex within the last six months, and who have had one of uh, infectious syphilis or a bacterially, sorry, of a bacterial STI uh, in the past 12 months, uh, the use of non-occupational HIV post-exposure prophylaxis more than once, um, an ongoing sexual relationship with an HIV positive partner with a substantial risk of transmissible HIV. So that's defined as an HIV viral load greater than 40 copies per mole. Um, and an HIV infection risk index for men who have sex with men score of greater than 11. So this is the scoring tool that, that can be used to help identify those who are at high risk for acquiring HIV, who would be good candidates for PrEP. Okay, so the second group that may be eligible for PrEP is heterosexual people. So this includes those who are HIV negative, with ongoing exposure to uh, HIV positive partners involving condomless or uh, vaginal or anal sex, where the HIV positive partner has a substantial risk of transmissible HIV. So again, that's an HIV viral load greater than 40 copies per mil, or where the HIV positive partner has a low but non-negligible risk of transmissible HIV. Um, so a low risk would be um, an HIV uh, positive partner who is believed to have an HIV viral load that's less than 40 copies per mil, um, but who has an, uh, uh, an STBBI present at the time of exposure. So um, if they are having ongoing other STIs, then it is sort of reasonable to consider in that scenario. Okay, so the third group that's eligible for PrEP is people who use drugs and who have ongoing sharing of injection drug use equipment uh, with a person who has a non-negligible risk of HIV infection. So this is technically an off-label use of tenofovir DF and emtricitabine. Um, and uh, the ARCH-IDU risk index is a screening tool uh, that you can use to help identify those who are at high risk of acquiring HIV um, for whom uh, PrEP may be considered. So you can just Google this or you can find a copy of this in uh, the Alberta PrEP guidelines. PrEP is not indicated for those who are in a monogamous relationship with a single partner with no or negligible risk of having transmissible HIV. And that's defined in the bottom right corner here. Uh, the guidelines do recommend to consult an HIV specialist for people with um, hepatitis B infection uh, and people who are pregnant or breastfeeding. I wouldn't uh, let that recommendation prevent you from using tenofovir DF and emtricitabine in reproductive age women who are at high risk of acquiring HIV. Um, but if a patient is pregnant, a referral to an HIV specialist for a more sort of nuanced risk benefit conversation is warranted. Okay, so once you've determined that your patient's eligible for PrEP, then you wanna begin a baseline evaluation. So you're gonna evaluate for signs or symptoms of acute HIV infection. So that's gonna include uh, fever, sore throat, rash, fatigue, myalgias, headache, and large lymph nodes. Um, and then you'll want to delay initiation of PrEP for symptomatic patients um, and then repeat HIV testing in 7 to 21 days to confirm a negative HIV test prior to initiating PrEP. Um, and then you're going to want to confirm that the patient's HIV negative with a fourth generation HIV test within two weeks of initiating PrEP. So just a note here, uh, don't use a rapid HIV test as a baseline test before starting PrEP. So that test has a longer window period and that's gonna increase your risk of having a false negative baseline test. Um, so yeah, so you do need that fourth generation test, which is the usual test you're gonna get back if you 
send off the sample to CADM. Uh, and then you want to screen for hepatitis A and B and vaccinate if someone's susceptible. Um, specifically, uh, you do want to know someone's hepatitis B status uh, because tenofovir and emtricitabine treats hepatitis B um, and stopping it can cause flare-ups. Um, and then you want to screen for hep C, syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia, and that's going to include urine, rectal, and throat swabs if it's indicated based on the type of sexual activity. Then you're going to want to do a CBC, a urinalysis, and a creatinine. Um, you want the EGFR to be greater than 60 in order to uh, initiate PrEP with tenofovir, DF, and emtricitabine. And you want to do a pregnancy test if applicable. Uh, and at the, at the baseline evaluation, you want to assess for and counsel on HIV and STBBI prevention strategies. You really do want to discuss the importance of adherence um, and uh, discuss risk versus benefits, sorry, benefits of PrEP. Okay, so the benefits of PrEP with tenofovir, DF, and emtricitabine uh, include that it's highly effective at reducing the risk of HIV when it's used consistently and correctly. Uh, so the medication is safe and side effects are rare. Antiretroviral drug resistance can develop if a person initi initiates PrEP uh, when they're HIV positive or if they develop poor adherence to PrEP. So, this just highlights the importance of having that negative HIV test uh, within two weeks of initiation of PrEP, and it um, underscores the importance of the repeat HIV viral load at one month post-PrEP initiation. Um, and also, it, it also highlights the importance of um, good adherence to PrEP in order to prevent resistance. So while I always recommend using condoms, uh, in particular, I encourage patients to consider them um, in the period that leads up to and after starting uh, PrEP to help prevent uh, HIV exposure until adequate cellular concentrations are achieved. So maximal intracellular levels of tenofovir, DF, and emtricitabine occur after about seven days in rectal tissue and at 20 days in cervical vaginal tissue. Um, so some patients are going to adhere to that and some patients won't, but I still think that it's worth um, discussing. Okay, so the most common side effects uh, of PrEP uh, with tenofovir, DF, and emtricitabine um, can include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, headache, and dizziness. Um, often many of the mild side effects will subside after four weeks or so of use. Um, and the more serious longer term side effects can include a decrease in bone mineral density um, that appears to be reversible on uh, discontinuation of PrEP. Um, and just a note that a DEXA um, isn't recommended uh, unless it's otherwise indicated. Um, and it is important uh, for patients with uh, low bone mineral density or osteoporosis to have like a good risk benefit discussion uh, with patients before you initiate PrEP. Um, and then another potential side effect is a decrease in kidney function um, that uh, does generally resolve on discontinuation. Okay, so the uh, typical way to take PrEP um, is with one tab once daily of the combination tablet of tenofovir, DF, and emtricitabine. So this is the only Health Canada approved method of administration of tenofovir, DF, and emtricitabine for PrEP. And prescribers should write meets part two EDS on patient prescriptions. Um, another option for PrEP is on demand or event driven PrEP, um, which is off label and it is not covered by pharmacy. Um, so uh, in this option, two pills are taken two to 24 hours before the first sexual exposure, uh, followed by one pill once daily until 48 hours after the last sexual exposure. Um, so an on-demand dosing schedule can be considered in cisgender men who have sex with men who are hepatitis B negative um, and who are able to effectively like, coordinate their dosing schedule around like planned sexual activity. Uh, if your patient meets eligibility criteria and starts on PrEP, then what does follow-up look like? Okay, so patients should follow up at one month with a repeat HIV test and a creatinine. And then you should see that patient every three months. And at those visits, you're going to want to confirm that they're still eligible for PrEP. Um, you want to evaluate for signs or symptoms of acute HIV infection. You want to assess for and counsel on HIV and STBBI prevention strategies, uh, adherence to PrEP, uh, and adverse effects of PrEP. 
you want to um, confirm that the patient is HIV negative with a fourth generation test. And you want to do STI screening for syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia. And you want to assess renal function with creatinine. Um, at nine circles, we also follow up with your analysis every three months. Um, so this isn't in the Manitoba or the Canadian PrEP guidelines. It is in the BC guidelines. Um, you can choose whether or not you, you may want to do a urinalysis every three months, um, but renal complications of PrEP can result in proteinuria, and sometimes glucosuria. So um, that's the reason for you know, considering your urinalysis. Um, and you wanna order a pregnancy test if that's applicable. And then annually, you're gonna to wanna to screen for hep C and for hepatitis B and those that are susceptible. Okay, so PrEP should be discontinued immediately if a patient has a positive HIV test, and then they should be referred to the Manitoba HIV program. Uh, if um, PrEP is no longer indicated, then it should be discontinued two to 28 days after the last sexual exposure. Uh, and an HIV test should be performed at the time of discontinuing PrEP, and then again, four to six weeks later. So prior to discontinuing PrEP, you're gonna to wanna to consider whether the patient has hepatitis C um, because tenofovir and emtricitabine are active against hep B and you can get these flare-ups on discontinuation. And then if someone wants to resume PrEP after discontinuing, they just go through the same initial evaluation that we already talked about. Okay, so um, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Bria, I'm totally inspired now to start prescribing PrEP because of this riveting uh, presentation. Um, so, uh, you know, let me out of the gate. Uh, how do I sign up? Um, so good question. Um, so this is the, um, you need to register to become a PrEP prescriber and the process is very easy. So just follow the link at the top. Uh, you need to submit this form that uh, confirms that you've read the provincial eligibility criteria and the HIV prevention guidelines and that uh, you'll ensure that uh, patients meet the eligibility criteria and then monitor them according to the guidelines. So it's quite quick. Um, so this is the link to the Manitoba PrEP eligibility criteria. So it's important to remember that uh, patients will need to apply for Pharmacare and then pay up to their deductible before PrEP is covered. And just so you know, Tenofovir, DF, and Emtricitabine cost about $250 for one month supply for those who don't have coverage. Um, so if you need extra support with PrEP, you can contact the Manitoba HIV program for general questions. Um, and another good resource for patient specific questions um, about PrEP is through eConsult. And um, so if you aren't an eConsult member, you can just sign up uh, with the um, email address that's on this slide. It's a great service, I recommend it. Okay, so registered PrEP prescribers who are interested in receiving PrEP referrals uh, can email hshr at outreach at wrha.mb.ca uh, in order to be added to the street connections map. Um, and so this is to identify for patients where in Manitoba they can access PrEP. And please also fill out the post webinar survey um, because we're hoping to learn who's interested in PrEP uh, and receiving PrEP referrals and whether we can facilitate a distribution, like a system of distribution of referrals. Um, so Nine Circles has been re receiving a significant increase in patients that are interested in PrEP since it's been added to the Pharmacare formulary, um, which is fantastic. Uh, but the nurses are sort of reaching their capacity to be able to accommodate these referrals. So we'd be super grateful uh, if we could figure out who's interested in receiving our referrals in their area uh, to help improve timely access to PrEP for patients in Manitoba. Okay, so the fifth component of HIV prevention uh, that we'll discuss is with uh, post-exposure prophylaxis. So for patients who are HIV negative, who've had a possible exposure to HIV, they can take antiretroviral medications for 28 days to reduce the risk of acquiring HIV. So post-exposure prophylaxis uh, should be initiated as soon as possible after the exposure, but it has to be within 72 hours. Uh, Post-exposure prophylaxis is covered by Pharmacare completely, so patients don't have to apply to Pharmacare and they don't have to reach their Pharmacare deductible in order to be covered. Uh, so patients should be referred to urgent care or the emergency department for uh, initiation of post-exposure prophylaxis. And then another important part of HIV prevention is uh, antiretroviral therapy uh, for HIV-positive patients. 
So patients with uh, HIV should be started on antiretroviral therapy as soon as possible. Um, and patients who take treatment regularly and maintain a consistently undetectable viral load can't transmit the virus through sexual intercourse. Okay, so the final component of HIV, uh, HIV prevention that we'll discuss uh, is prevention of mother to child transmission. So providers should discuss contraception options for patients who are HIV positive, not pregnant, and of childbearing years. Uh, and for patients who are pregnant and are HIV negative, uh, providers should offer HIV testing at the first prenatal visit, again at the, in the third trimester, and then um, a delivery if their HIV status is unknown. And um, for patients who are HIV positive and pregnant, uh, an urgent referral is indicated uh, to the Manitoba HIV program uh, and the PEDS infectious disease program. Um, transmission of HIV from mother to child is less than 1% with interventions like antiretroviral therapy during pregnancy, a delivery, and to infants after birth. And a C-section can sometimes be considered in certain circumstances. Okay, so that is it for the portion of the presentation on HIV prevention. Um, so all of these strategies are needed uh, for prevention of new HIV infections. Um, and I just wanna stress that PrEP can be easily integrated into primary care. The process for registration is straightforward. And it is a really great service uh, to be able to offer your patients to help prevent HIV for those who are at high risk. So I will pass it over to Kelby who can help to uh, facilitate some questions. For sure, yeah, thanks so much, Bria. Uh, so we will now have the opportunity for some interaction between participants and today's speakers. Um, again, just seeing here to tap, um, put your questions in the box and use the upvote if anything is important for you to see. Um, so we'll first address some of the questions you asked as part of your registration in this webinar. Um, so the first one I'll direct to Lori. Um, are three HIV tests within six months still recommended following exposure for example, a needle stick. Hi, yeah, thanks for the question. So uh, Manitoba has a post-exposure prophyla prophylaxis protocol and the recommendations following a potential exposure are to be tested at baseline and then to have repeat testing uh, at four to six weeks and then an additional test at 12 weeks post uh, potential exposure to HIV. The only caveat being if someone were to also have been exposed to hepatitis C and seroconverted and became hepatitis C positive, antibody positive, they do re recommend an additional test at six months post exposure. Excellent. Uh, this one I'll direct towards Bria. Uh, will PrEP be accessible to teens in Manitoba? So, Tadafavir DF and M tricytabine. Uh, is approved by Health Canada for people who are 18 years of age and older. Um, but an individual healthcare provider um, could choose to prescribe it to a person who is under 18. Um, in the US, the FDA has approved um, tenofovir DF and tricytabine in adolescent patients um, who weigh uh, at least 35 kilograms. Um, and their um, you know, hasn't been a study looking specifically at the like effectiveness among youth, um, but we sort of presume it would probably have a similar effectiveness. Um, but one of the concerns is, is sort of regarding safety. Um, so because, you know, bone mass generally peaks in young adulthood um, and peak bone mass is a predictor of bone health later on, there is a concern that tenofovir DF use in youth can increase the risk of low bone mineral density um, later in life. Um, it's possible that tenofovir related bone loss could be greater in children who are less mature, like 10 or stage one to two, uh, than if uh, those who would be more mature, like 10 or stage three and above. Um, and there are some studies that are underway to determine if there are ways to sort of mitigate these effects, like with calcium and vitamin D, but we don't know yet. Um, and then there's also one other potential issue with side effect in that um, m tricytabine associated hyperpigmentation may occur at a higher frequency in pediatric patients compared with adult patients. Um, the Adolescent Trials Network did um, study chancre DF and m tricytabine in um, patients who, like for pre-exposure prophylaxis in patients who are 15 to 17 years of age. And it was well tolerated among those who took their medication, um, but adherence was quite like very much suboptimal for many of the youth. So that might indicate if you are prescribing to uh, youth that 
um, enhanced support and encouraging uh, encouragement for adherence might be important. Um, so basically, like an individualized risk benefit discussion should happen between a provider and a patient uh, to determine whether like a pre-exposure prophylaxis is right for that individual. From what I can tell, I'm only speaking on behalf of me here, but um, from what I can tell, uh, the primary care cri eligibility criteria don't actually give any um, like particular age criteria. Um, and I'm going to do a very brief side discussion here. Um, so um, there is another medication that's called um, tenofovir alafenamide, and it's in a combination tablet with uh, emtricitabine. Um, so a little bit different than the tenofovir DF, it's tenofovir AF. Um, and uh, it has been, uh, it has lower risk of renal and bone um, side effects. It has been studied in pre-exposure prophylaxis in adults um, for specifically the men who have sex with men population who took it daily. Um, and so um, some providers may prefer to administer tenofovir AF and emtricitabine to the adolescent um, population. Um, it is technically, uh, like it is an on-label um, indication, um, like approved by Health Canada. Um, uh, it was, there's probably still a little bit less experience um, in this age group. The studies are actually in adults, not in youth, but there has been some safety data of the individual components of that medication in youth. Um, and so like, it's a possibility that could be considered. Um, I haven't ever used it, it's quite expensive. So it's about $1,200 a month. Um, and uh, so anyways, that's something that maybe we'll get a little bit more information on, something that might be considered, but it's, it's quite um, cost prohibitive for, I would say the majority of patients. So anyways, the summary in there is individual risk benefit conversation. It was a very long way to say that. <laughs> awesome, thanks, Bria. Um, this next one for Lori, uh, what is the value of point of care testing in resource poor environments? Um, sorry, that was about POCT tests in poor, our resource poor environments? So the point of care tests are a third generation test. So it's only looking for antibodies. So it's not as good as the uh, fourth generation tests that are done at CADM lab at picking up new infections. So there are circumstances though, where it does make sense if you don't have access to other uh, testing modalities. But if, if someone comes in and they've had a recent exposure, you can, do a point of care test at the same time as uh, at the fourth generation um, blood draw. That'll tell you, give you some information to be able to discuss if they, you know, if they had already been infected with HIV, that point of care test would be positive um, to give them. It's also just a screen, so it doesn't give a confirmative diagnosis. You still need to draw the blood test to confirm an HIV infection. Excellent. Okay. Um, and for, uh, for Bria, how can we manage patients who request PrEP, um, but fall outside of the available eligibility guidelines or Pharmacare's criteria? So um, I think in this scenario, again, an individualized risk benefit conversation is warranted uh, with each patient. So um, there's going to be patients who clearly meet the criteria. Um, there's going to be patients for whom PrEP is like clearly not indicated and really need more education surrounding how HIV is transmitted. And then there certainly are gonna be circumstances where someone doesn't quite meet the criteria, but are like a reasonable case for pre-exposure prophylaxis can be made. Um, so I think it's important to inform patients um, of the potential risks of you know, the medication and compare that to that patient's individual risk of acquiring HIV and then inform patients when they fall outside of the groups of patients for which um, like for whom PrEP has been studied um, and then come to a decision like with your patient regarding pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, but I, I will just say sort of in my personal opinion, I do think we have a responsibility to um, adhere to the pharmacare criteria and really only write meets EDS on prescriptions that the patient truly does meet EDS criteria. Um, just because, you know, we're in a resource limited health system, I think it is um, reasonable uh, to make sure that we um, have the resources to cover those who are the most, like the highest risk of acquiring HIV and those for whom like PrEP has been studied and shown to be effective. Um, so for patients who don't need that, um, uh, if you do decide to pre prescribe PrEP, I'd probably just recommend writing does not meet EDS criteria on those prescriptions. 
Excellent. Oh, I was just going to add that also some third party insurance will cover the cost of prep. Um, and there was something else I was going to say there. Um, I've lost that. <laughs> but yes, I, oh, the cost of um, the cost of uh, M-tricitabine TDF is uh, approximately two hundred fifty dollars per month. So people are paying out of pocket, and that that's the generic form. I see that question, I think, came up in the chat, and that that it is, it is available generically, and it's two hundred fifty dollars a month. Excellent. Thanks, Lori. Um, yeah. Um, so now I'll move into the Q&A and we'll try to get through as many of these as possible. Um, one is, is PrEP covered by NA, NIHB? Yes. Excellent. Um, this question, I think, directed to you, Bria. In jurisdictions with significant PrEP use, has there been an increase in STBBIs? Um, and you already answered about the generic there, Lori. So yeah, are we seeing more increase in STBBIs where PrEP is being used? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I, um, I'm not sure, like I don't actually have any like Manitoba data on that. Um, I, think, I think initially there wasn't seen to be a lot, but then maybe sort of anecdotally, I have heard that there like people have noticed some, but I don't have any like great data to tell you on that. Um, but it is possible if people were feeling more safe in terms of reducing risk of, of HIV, like it's possible that they could have uh, um, increase in um, yeah, sexual behaviors that might transmit other STBBIs. So um, I'm sorry that I don't have a, an exact number to tell you there. Maybe Lori, uh, maybe Lori knows more than me here, but, um, but it just really does highlight that the importance of uh, screening for the other STBBIs while you're prescribing PrEP. Excellent. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and, and also, if you if you look at the criteria for prep, there were, the recommendations are really to prescribe for people that are high risk and are already getting sexually transmitted infections in order to prevent HIV. Yeah. Um, if a patient has multiple indeterminate results in a row, how many times should you continue to test for HIV every two to four weeks? Great question. And CADM Lab is excellent as providing those recommendations right on the result. So it'll usually say for an indeterminate, and in, in what, we're, what we're getting at is with the indeterminate result, what might be happening is someone's seroconverting and they just have the positive P24 antigen seen on the, on the test result, but they don't have antibodies. So if, if that's the case, CADM Lab will usually say repeat testing in two to three weeks. Sometimes we'll also request that you bring people in to draw another sample for a pro-viral um, test. I, if people have multiple indeterminate results, it's likely, and I don't, I don't see the results, so I'm not sure exactly what this looks like, but what I'm understanding is there's not an increase in the antibodies or getting the same consistent result that isn't an HIV antibody. It's maybe a nonspecific reaction or some other cross-reacting antibody, but They'll, they'll tell you on the result to call the CADM lab doctor on call and they'll explain to say, no, this is an HIV or no, you need to bring someone back to um, do some repeat testing. Excellent. So I just repeat uh, once and then call the lab doctor on call. <laughs> Great, it sounds like they give really good guidance. Um, what is the reason for the year analysis rather do, than doing an ACR if we're looking for renal dysfunction? So um, at nine circles, we do both. We do routine ACRs and year analysis um, every three months. And that might pick up proteinuria like a little bit earlier before the year analysis is positive. You, get, you can also get a little bit of extra information from the year analysis. Um, so again, like if someone was having um, uh, like to off of your toxicity can have um, glucose in the urine without having all the glucose in the blood, for example. So like, there's a little bit extra that you could do, but um, like that you could glean from that, like slightly more. We do both at uh, nine circles, but you can kind of choose what you, like which of those you want to offer. I think you'd, um, yeah, you probably pick it up reasonably well either way. Excellent. Um, wondering about if there's a way to integrate point of care testing into eChart. Um, and a follow up to that is will the HIV program accept a referral of a point of care testing positive result? Oh, Lori, you're just muted there, I think. 
Yeah, sorry. sorry. I was just asking if you could repeat the beginning of that question. Oh, sorry. Is there a way to integrate point of care testing to e-chart? I'm presuming they mean maybe the results. Yeah. No. And will the program accept a positive point of care test result? So to refer to the program, it, we do have a referral, um, a referral uh, form. We ask that providers um, relay the diagnosis to patients and then consent for their referral to our program. And um, so a point of care test doesn't um, actually confirm the diagnosis. So serology should be drawn to confirm before you refer. We do work really closely with public health so that in those cir circumstances that they, they, they are supporting to help reach out and retest people. I know they do point of care tests at Main Street Project. So we're trying to get people their confirmatory serology prior to referral for care. Excellent. Um, and maybe on a similar train, can point of care testing be used as surveillance while on PrEP? Um, so uh, I would recommend uh, doing the B24 antigen just to pick it up. As, like that's what we sort of do as our routine follow up for PrEP, just to pick it up as early as is possible. You definitely, like, especially for the baseline test, that's gonna be the most critical one there. Um, for the baseline test, you definitely want it to be uh, a P24 antigen just because of that longer window period um, uh, for the uh, rapid test. Um, you really want to make sure when you're starting someone on PrEP that they're not HIV positive and you're not gonna give them more resistant to HIV. Um, so yeah. Okay. I would recommend using the, the P24 if you can on an ongoing basis. And, I, and definitely like 100% is the baseline one for sure. Excellent. Um, asking about is Discovy also covered as PrEP on EDS2 slash will it be? Uh, no, Discovy. So Discovy, that's the tenofovir, alafenamide, and m -tricytabine, And it's not, um, it's not covered on the care formulary. And, that's and the one that's is there any talk about. if it will be? Not that I know of, but uh, I am not uh, usually in those conversations. So, uh, but I haven't heard anything about it like coming down the pipeline or anything like that. Okay. Excellent. So I think we are uh, getting kind of close to one o'clock. So I know there are still questions in the Q and A. Um, some have been actually been answered in the Q and A, which is awesome. A uh, shout out to Shauna Chan for answering some of our questions as we go along. Um, I do just want to let you um, know about promoting your clinic as a prep access site. Um, we will be sending out a link for an evaluation of the program and please indicate in the evaluation if you do want a certificate of participation for your main pro plus credits. Um, and so some folks have asked about getting access to the slides. Um, so it, we are posting this presentation on the Manitoba HIV website. Um, and we have a link to the guidelines there. If you do specifically want the slide deck, um, please email um, Kimberly Templeton, who's our program lead directly, and she can forward uh, the slides to you. Uh, so hopefully that uh, answer some folks who are wanting to have the slides. And thanks again to uh, Dr. Ireland and Dr. Sharkey for your amazing presentation. Um, we will continue addressing the remainder of these qu um, questions in a uh, compendium online. So hopefully we can answer all that for everybody. Excellent. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your Wednesday. Thank thanks. you.